Good morning, Year 9. Welcome to Wednesday's lesson. We are halfway through the week, so well done for all of your hard work so far. Today we are going to continue with our study of Romeo and Juliet, moving on to Act 1, Scene 4. Before we get into the content, can you please pause the video now and copy down the title, date and the learning objective. Press play when you have those three things written down, please. OK, if you're back, that means you're ready to complete the do now. As always, the expectation is that you write the answers to these questions in four sentences. These five questions are based on what we have previously read. So you can refer back to your notes if you need to, or you can challenge yourself and try and do it from memory. Pause the video and answer the five questions on screen now, please. OK, if you're back, that means you're ready to make your purple pen corrections. Please make sure that you write the correct answer or any additional information that you see in my answers in purple pen. So the servant asks Romeo and Benvolio to read the invitation list because he is illiterate. Um, you know, that's signifying the um, division in class. Romeo agrees to go to the feast because Rosaline is attending and he hopes that he can win her over. Juliet is 13 years old. Her father said that she hasn't seen the turn of 14 yet, meaning she's 13. Juliet agrees to see if she can love Paris. She's a bit reluctant, but she doesn't want to disappoint her mother. And the nurse is linked to the vulgarity of men due to her humorous, vulgar view of sex and marriage. She's a very interesting character and we will study her in a little bit more detail later. Pause the video and make any purple pen corrections that you need to now, please. OK, so before we get into Act 1, Scene 4, I want to give you a summary. So Romeo, Benvolio, Mercutio and others from the Montague household make their way to the Capulet feast. Obviously, we know already that there is a feud between them and it's not exactly the um, best idea. Um, Mercutio is a friend of Romeo's, um, but he kind of aligns himself, therefore, with the Montague family. So they're wearing the masks. Um, it's like a masquerade party concealing their identity. And they decide that they're just going to stay for one dance and one dance only. And Romeo continues to be lovesick for Rosaline. Mercutio teases him, winds him up a little bit for being such a stereotypical hopeless lover. Remember, you know, it was more um, typical or expected of a man to be a bit more kind of bold and brazen um, when it comes to love. And Romeo isn't like that. Uh, Mercutio then delivers a speech that is known as the Queen Mab speech in which he describes how the fairy delivers dreams to humans as they sleep. Um, that speech is kind of a, a big metaphor in the text, um, but we're not going to look at it today because I want to make sure we get through the whole play, but we um, will return to this and analyse this later if we have time because it's very interesting. So let's get straight into Act 1, Scene 4. We're starting right at the beginning. So on um, stage right now, there is Romeo, Mercutio, Benvolio, and then um, kind of a few other members of the kind of Montague clan who are wearing masks ready to attend the ball. Romeo says, what shall this speech be spoke for our excuse or shall we on without apology? Um, Romeo seems a little bit concerned here. He says, what will we say is our excuse for being here or should we just enter without apologising? Um, obviously, Romeo is aware of the depth of the feud and the potential danger that could arise from him attending a Capulet ball. Benvolio replies, the day is out of such prolixity. We'll have no Cupid hoodwinked with a scarf bearing a Tartar painted bow of lath, scarring the ladies like a crow keeper, nor no without book prologue faintly spoke after the prompter for our entrance but let them measure us by what they will we'll measure them a measure and be gone um so benvolio says it's 
out of date to give lengthy kind of explanations. Um, the idea of uh, like longevity or long windedness um, is the meaning of this word here. Um, he said, we're not going to introduce our dance by having someone dress up as Cupid or carrying a toy bow to frighten the ladies like a scarecrow. He said, nor are we going to kind of recite a speech, a prologue um, to introduce ourselves. They said, let them um, let them judge us however they please. We'll give them a dance and then hit the road. Um, so let them measure us, let them judge us. We'll measure them a measure and be gone. So they can measure their measure, their dancing, and then be gone. Now, there's an interesting kind of uh, contrast here that I want to touch on. Um, this Benvolio kind of references um, speaking um, like a nor no without book prologue um faintly spoke after the prompter for our entrance um so lady capulet's view of love was highlighted in her comparison to love like a book um and kind of you know how paris is without a cover and therefore requires a wife to be whole um and she kind of gives this kind of romantic um kind of like whimsical view of love Whereas Benvolio's is a lot more kind of logical. He says we're not going to kind of um, do anything fancy. Um, we're not going to uh, try to be something that we're not. Um, and that contrasts the view of love between the female characters and the male characters here. And they both use a reference to kind of a book, but they use that reference in very different ways to express their very different attitudes. Romeo says, give me a torch. I am not for this ambling. Being but heavy, I will bear the lie. He says, give me a torch. I am i don't want to dance ambling um, because I feel so sad. I'm heavy. I will be the one that carries the light. So this is obviously a reference to his depressed mental state. Um, the idea that he is heavy, kind of the fact that this unrequited love is almost a weight on his shoulders um, and he cannot experience happiness until that weight is alleviated. Mercutio says, nay, gentle Romeo, we must have you dance. He says, no, Romeo, no, you're going to dance. We're at a ball. You have to try um, and kind of like lift your spirits. And that's Mercutio's role here to try and lift Romeo's spirits. Romeo says, not I, believe me, you have dancing shoes with nimble soles. I have a soul of lead, so stakes me to the ground. I cannot move. He says, no, believe me, um, you're wearing dancing shoes um, with kind of nimble soles that are good for dancing. But I have a soul of lead because it's so heavy um, that I cannot move. So, again, a reference to kind of like the heaviness of his unrequited love, um, you know, giving him this inability to do anything that might provide him joy. Um, as it weights him down. Mercutio says, you are a lover, borrow Cupid's wings and soar with them above a common bound. He says, no, sort yourself out. He's trying to, again, lift Romeo's spirits here. He says, you're a lover. He said, take Cupid's wings and fly higher than the average man, a common bound. He says, go be above sorry this unrequited love get past this unrequited love you're better than this romeo again disagrees woe is me i am too sore and pierced with his shaft to soar with his light feathers and so bound i cannot bound a pitch above dull woe under love's heavy burden do i sink he says that cupid's bow has pierced him too deeply so he cannot fly, he cannot soar, um, because the wound that has been created by Cupid's arrow has pierced him so deeply um, that it kind of weighs him down, this idea of being bound. Um, he says, I cannot bound a pitch above dull woe. He said, I can't leap any higher or fly any higher um, than my dull sadness. And he says, I sink under the heavy weight of love. And again, um, we have this idea of being kind of bound by love, um, this inescapable 
or pain that he's experiencing and this kind of you know all these references under the semantic field of like heaviness for Romeo that's continued throughout Mercutio says, and to sink in it should you burden love to great oppression for a tender thing. Mercutio says, if you sink, you are dragging love down. It's not right to drag down something as tender as love. He basically says to Romeo, look, you're doing a disservice to love, which is supposed to bring you joy. Um, so you need to get over it. And again, Mercutio kind of shares that similar message with Benvolio, where both of the men are trying to um, infuse Romeo to seek happiness and get past this unrequited love for Rosaline. Romeo questions this. He says, is love a tender thing? Obviously, his pain is causing him to question whether love is actually all that great. He says, it is too rough, too rude, too boisterous, and it pricks like scorn. He said, I think it's too rough, too rude, too kind of like rowdy, and it kind of stings like a thorn. And now these references to kind of, you know, like the like nature, like a prick, um, indicates that love is kind of uncontrollable, wild and painful. So the word boisterous, you might describe a puppy as boisterous or a dog um, when they're kind of a little bit rowdy and a bit energetic. And this highlights, you know, the uncontrollable nature of love. It kind of comes and goes. You can't control it um, and it can be painful. Makusha goes, if love be rough with you, be rough with love. Prick love for pricking and you beat love down. He says, Romeo, if love's going to be horrible to you and play rough with you, you play rough with love. Prick love for pricking and you beat love down. He said, if you prick love when it pricks you, you'll beat love down. So again, he's telling Romeo to be strong and powerful. He says, give me a case to put my visage in, um, which is his mask. Um, a visor for a visor. What care I? What curious eye doth coat deformities? He says, um, a mask to put over my other mask. So the idea that his face is already a mask. A mask for maybe his feelings, um, a mask for maybe his um, opinions. We don't know. And then he says, um, "Why? what do I care if some curious person sees my flaws? And again, Mikusho has this kind of view of life and love whereby he doesn't really care what anyone thinks. Um, he's very logical, very cynical, um, and he's quite straight talking. And then he says, here are the beetle brows that shall blush for me. He says, uh, let this mask with its um, black eyebrows blush for me. And then they put on their masks and go forward to the ball. Oh, sorry. I, I knew there was another um, annotation that I missed. So the idea of um, all this heavy imagery, burdened, bound, um, it kind of shows the kind of constrictive and restrictive impact of love, particularly on the character of Romeo, as he cannot control it. Okay, so we have two quotes on the um, screen now. Have a look at them. And can you figure out what kind of um, wordplay is being used here? So you might have thought of puns. So these quotes are both examples of puns. We looked at puns when we looked at the servants at the beginning of the play. And puns are jokes that exploit the different meanings of words which sound alike. So, for example, in um, this example here, we have the wordplay of souls and soul. Um, they sound the same, but they have very different meanings. So what I would like you to do is pause the video now and create two mind maps for each of these quotes. I would say you probably need about 10 lines to make sure you have enough space around each of these quotes to annotate. Pause the video, create those mind maps and press play when that is done, please. OK, if you're back, that means you have your two mind maps and you're ready to annotate. I'm now going to ask you to analyse these quotes, particularly focus on the puns and their impact. These are the questions that I want you to ask yourself as you're annotating. Which words are being played on in the pun? 
Um, what are they a metaphor for? What are the puns a metaphor for? What is the different meanings of the words that are being played on? What does it reveal about Mercutio? What does it reveal about Romeo? Are they similar? Are they dissimilar? Do they contrast? Why? And why has Shakespeare used puns here? For what impact? Why did he not just use a normal line? Um, why did he decide to play on these words? For what purpose? So there are six questions on the slide. So you should have a minimum of six annotations for each of the quotations. Um, you can also have more if there's some other things that you want to unpick. But there should be a minimum of six annotations for each quote. Pause the video and complete those mind maps now, please. OK, if you're back, that means you completed your mind maps. Now we're going to skip on a little bit um, to a, a later section of Act 1, Scene 4. It's a kind of um, quite a crucial part of the scene and it takes place after Mercutio's Queen Mab's speech and it almost sets out um, what the atmosphere and the mood is going to be like in Act 1, Scene 5. So, we've already talked a little bit about fate, um, particularly in the prologue, and that kind of theme is continued through the text. And the section that we're going to look at right now, like I said, kind of sets us up to um, expect a certain kind of atmosphere and tone um, and event during the next scene. So a bit of context, people in Shakespeare's time believed in astrology. So um, they had this view that a person's future was decided by the stars and the planets. You might have heard the phrase, oh, um, their love was written in the stars. The idea that the um, future is predetermined by the stars. Shakespeare, however believe that people had free will and that they, through their choices, were in charge of their own fate. So the idea that um, you can grasp your fate and you can change it dependent on your actions. And this tension between these two views is explored throughout the text. And we see the downsides to um, going along with fate and also going against fate. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video now, write a little subheading of fate and then jot down these two points. You can shorten them so they're just in note form, but um, you need to get the kind of key information down. Pause the video, write down a little subtitle of fate and make some notes based on these two pieces of information. Now, please. OK, if you're back, that means you have some notes about fate down and we're ready to look at the extract. So this is said by Romeo, like I said, at the end of Mercutio's Queen Mab speech. And this is what he says. I fear too early for my mind misgives some consequence yet hanging in the stars shall bitterly begin his fearful date with the night revels and expire the term of a despised life closed in my breast by some vile forfeit of untimely death. But he that hath the steerage of my course direct my sail on lusty gentlemen. So he says that I'm worried that we'll get there um, too early. Um, he says, I'm, like, I'm a bit concerned that we're going to get there too early. And he says that he feels um, like something bad is going to happen. There is some consequence yet hanging in the stars. Um, Remember what we said about stars earlier and how that links to fate. He has this, this, this feeling that something bad is going to happen. And he said that whatever this thing is, whatever this bad thing is, it shall bitterly begin his fearful date. Um, basically, whatever happens at this party is going to steer him towards his death. Um, and it says expire the term of a despised life closed in um, my breast again. Um, a link to how his life will expire um, and begin this this date, this fearful date will begin his demise and downfall into it ultimately, his untimely death. 
you know, untimely linking to maybe the fact that he's young and he hasn't found like love yet. He hasn't had a family, hasn't experienced life. Um, and it's a forfeit for him. He forfeits his life, um, maybe for his love. Then he says, but he that hath the steerage of my course directs my sail. Um, the capitalization of he there could be kind of referencing a God or a greater being. Um, we will talk about religion a little bit later. Um, and he says, but whoever steer, whoever's in charge of where my life's going can steer me wherever they want. And then he said, let's go. Um, lusty gentleman kind of being like lover boy. He's like, let's go. Let's enjoy the women. Let's have a dance. Um, and again, this indicates this line here indicates that he has faith in fate and what is destined to be and he said look whatever happens um i'm gonna accept it and i'm gonna kind of go with it i'm not gonna try and change my fate which kind of goes against what shakespeare is um views of fate are as he believes that man should have free will to to kind of decide their own futures so there's a bit to unpick here so i'd like you to answer these below questions based on this little extract here so foreboding is a bit different to foreshadowing. Foreboding is a feeling that something bad is going to happen, this kind of fearful apprehension. Um, what does Romeo feel is fated in this scene or what is foreboded in this scene? Um, why might Romeo feel fearful upon entering the party? Think about the feud. Um, where have we experienced the recurring motif of stars before? Um, what does this figurative language suggest? So what does this figurative language um, related to hanging in the stars um, suggest about what's going to happen? And how does this section juxtapose Mercutio? Think about how Mercutio said they're going to enter the ball and how he's going to um, kind of behave at the ball. How is that different to what we see from Romeo here? You can always rewind to look back at um, the sections of Mercutio's speech if you would like a reminder. Pause the video and complete these five questions now, please. Okay, if you're back, that means you complete the five questions and you're ready to submit. I would pause the video now so you can quickly read through this as a reminder of how I would like you to submit your work. Send it to my email and then you can go ahead and continue with the rest of your lessons. I look forward to seeing all of your excellent notes in my emails.